Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, June 5th meeting of the Bellingham City Council. I'd like to call this meeting to order. But before we go any further, um, I would like to take a moment for a member of our community who passed away this morning. Some of you know Mr. Bill Disler. Bill Disler served his country as a Vietnam veteran, and then after the war, he served it as a peace advocate. Um, I'd like to give a quote by Mr. Disler, and then a moment of silence, please. He said, I do believe things will get better. Maybe I'm naive, but I really believe that if we all keep trying and doing what we can do, change will happen. Please join me. Thank you, everyone. Uh, two announcements. On Tuesday, June 13th, that's coming up very soon, the Bellingham City Council will host a town hall meeting, the first of its kind, and the topic we've chosen is housing. The event will take place at the Bellingham High School Auditorium, which is located on 2020 Cornwall Avenue, from 6.30 to 8.30, and the doors will open a half hour before that at 6 o'clock. We'll start out with a panel discussion that will be followed by time for members of the public to offer their ideas and potential solutions on our housing issues. The next day on Wednesday, June 14th at noon here at City Hall, we will host a flag raising ceremony for the newly adopted Bellingham flag right out here in front at the City Hall Flag Plaza. And then afterwards, the ceremony will be followed by an open house in the new offices for the City Council, which is right down this hall on the second floor. We just moved in there recently. Um, our offices are now located there along with that of the hearing examiner. Uh, please come and join us uh, right after the flag raising ceremony. And then finally coming up next month on Monday, July 10th at 7 p.m. here in City Council Chambers, we will host a public hearing on amendments to the comprehensive plan, in particular to the Cordata neighborhood plan. Would you please now all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Thank you very much. Roll call. April Barker. Here. Dan Hamill. Here. Jean Knudsen. Here. Michael Lilliquist. Here. Roxanne Murphy. Here. Pinky Vargas. Here. Terry Borneman. Here. Okay, thank you. So um, we are going to begin the evening with two public hearings and our usual procedures to have the public hearings, then we'll follow that by the 15 minute public comment period. We have a number of people signed up for the 15, pu 15 minute public comment period, but first we're gonna have two hearings. Um, each of these may take a little while. Uh, please be patient with us. Uh, are, um, Mr. Sepler, are we gonna handle them each separately individually or combine them in some way? Um, we will handle them separately. Okay. Two different staff reports. Okay, so the first one is a public hearing to consider a comprehensive plan amendment to the Barkley neighborhood plan, a rezone a portion of the property located within area one from residential single, its current zoning to commercial planned. I see Mr. Moshe Quinn is here. Do you want to start though? I'll start. Um, members of the council, good evening. Uh, we come before you to present the planning commission's recommendation on this proposed amendment and also to give you background. Uh, our planner, uh, as he calls up the uh, file will present a background on the application for comp plan amendment. As council is aware, comp plan amendments are bundled, considered in a docket, are subject to review at the planning commission as well as council. Um, should this be acted on, this would amend our comprehensive plan and specifically the land use and map shown on the, um, I think it's the official land use map contained in the plan. Good evening, my name is Moshe Quinn. I'm with the Planning and Community Development Department. And tonight is a public hearing to consider a request for a rezone for a property located at 3001 East Sunset Drive. So the property owner had submitted a request in 2017 to rezone a small portion of his property that's located in area one of the Barkley neighborhood, which is highlighted here in red from residential single to commercial planned. The area is located in the northeast section of the city adjacent to Sunset Drive and just uh, west from Trickle Creek Boulevard. Currently the applicant owns this whole entire area 
within Area 27 and this small portion of property here. So to give you a little bit of background on this is that uh, the main portion of the applicant's property, that zone commercial plan, was recently annexed in 2016. And the uh, comparable zoning that the city adopted was commercial plan for that area as they had a vested land use application with the county for a neighborhood city for a, excuse me, for a neighborhood center. And um, the city adopted the comparable zoning to that. However, the southwest portion of the property was already in the city and zoned residential single. And so that's the 11,000 square foot area or 0.25 acres. Therefore, uh, the only way to change that is through a comprehensive plan amendment. Uh, both the Planning Commission and City Council docked the proposal for review in 2017. Some more background. Um, on January 10th, the applicant held a neighborhood meeting. No one from the public attended the meeting and there was no public comment provided. A SEPA non-project determination of non-significant was issued on March 3rd, 2017 and no comment was also submitted regarding that environmental determination. On April 20th, the Planning Commission held a public hearing and voted 7-0 to recommend approval to the Council of the proposed rezone. So the current issue with this is that the main property as well as the area has two zoning designations of commercial plan and residential single. It's located in two neighborhood sub areas and having two different zonings and two different sub areas really creates inconsistent zoning as there's different development standards as well as uses that are allowed within those specific areas and they conflict with each other a lot of times. So here is an aerial view of today. And so this right here was the existing city limit line. So this area was in the city since the early 1900s. And this is the main portion that was annexed in 2016. Um, with this zoning boundary here, when the applicant develops this property and not considering any environmental constraints, he would have additional setbacks of 20 feet from this zone line for, for buildings, 10 feet for parking, as well as within 100 feet, his building height's limited 35 feet. So in the commercial plan zone, the director approves the final building height with the development proposal. So there's some zoning inconsistencies there. As well, as you can see here, this area here is a pipeline easement that goes it's a 50 foot wide. And so it, it leaves very little area to develop, to develop a single family residential dwelling unit as the minimum density there is 10,000 square feet in area one. Plus with the additional arterial setback that would be required from Sunset Avenue it leaves a very small footprint, which may also need variances to be approved to build there. However, when this area is combined with the main portion, it provides more development opportunity. So staff reviewed this proposal uh, and the proposal meets the comprehensive plan amendment criteria as well as the rezone criteria. It also is consistent with the 2016 Bellingham comprehensive plan as the goals and policies that are listed within your, your packet. So the proposal would enable the property owner to develop under a single zoning classification. It corrects an inconsistent zoning boundary and it simplifies development regulations, improves development options for the property owner, and promotes the efficient use of land. Planning Commission and staff both recommend a, approval of the rezone request and that concludes my presentation and I could take any questions that council may have at this time. Okay, does council have any questions before we open the meeting? Okay. Um, I did see a sign-up sheet for the public hearing. Is, is, was there outside? Um, Moshe, would you mind checking? I'm going to go ahead and open up the public hearing. Yes, uh, we have two people signed up. First, Mr. Gary Pedersen, and then followed by Jeff Kwame. Uh, Gary, would you like to come forward? And I thought that was for the other one. So. For the next one? Yeah. You can certainly speak then. Jeff, would you like to come forward? Public you, yeah, public comment, we can, you can speak then. 
Good evening, Council. Um, I'm the applicant. Uh, my name is Jeff Quam. And um, really, I have nothing more to add other than I, I go along with the Planning Commission and staff's uh, recommended approval. <laughs> That's good. How's that? Jeff? Good job, buddy. <laughs> Is there anybody else who would like to come forward and speak to this public hearing? Seeing none, can we turn the volume down a little bit? Um, seeing none, I'll go ahead and bring the uh, public hearing to a close, turn it back to the council. Roxanne? I'll go along with everybody else and move approval. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. So our usual Thank procedure you. is if there's a hearing and any issues raised, we defer to a work session. I saw no issues being raised. Anybody else? Okay. All those in favor I of... Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Rox, um, April. I wasn't able to watch the planning commission meeting. Did anybody have anything oh, to say there? I apologize. Yes, one person uh, provided some public testimony in support of the proposal. They had property right across from this uh, rezone area. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? Um, all those in favor of passing this ordinance to um, adopt a comprehensive plan amendment and a rezone of this small portion of property located within area one from residential single to commercial plan, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that passes unanimously. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll now go on to the next public hearing, which is also a comprehensive plan amendment. This is to consider a comprehensive plan amendment to the Cordata neighborhood plan. And this would be a rezone, a portion of property located within area 20, which is currently residential, single to industrial planned. Mr. Sepler, would you care to begin this one too? Or would Ryan like to start? Similarly, that this matter comes to council after a uh, public hearing in front of the Planning Commission. Um, you're familiar with it because you docketed it after Planning Commission recommended it. Um, it's one that um, has uh, specific merits, and Ryan will go over the Planning Commission recommendation and the history of the application. Good evening, City Council. My name is Ryan Nelson with the Planning and Community Development Department. I'll be presenting the rezone request for 4260 Pacific Highway this evening. So the proposed rezone is located in the Cordata neighborhood. This is in the northwestern portion of the city limits, and the proposal is to rezone it from residential single to industrial planned. A little bit of the background on this site. It was annexed into the city in 2013. Um, this is something that city council has seen before. Both planning, the planning commission and city council have docketed this for um, review under the 2017 work program. On December 15th, 2016, the applicant held a neighborhood meeting. One adjacent property owner to the south attended the meeting. They did not express any specific concerns during the meeting, and to date, staff has not received any comment on the uh, proposed rezone. Staff has uh, issued a SEPA non-project determination of non-significance in March, and we held a public hearing before the Planning com Commission on April 20th, where the Planning Commission recommended approval 7-0 to um, City Council for approval of the proposed rezone. So issues, uh, the subject site has, um, has a few unique components associated with it. One, it is one piece of property that's bisected by zoning. So half of the, piece, half of the one piece of property is in um, residential zoning, the other half is in industrial plan, there's no right of way or easement or property boundary, which typically you find between zoning designations. Um, there are limited development opportunities to the subject proposal due to wetlands and fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas to the east of the site. And it also has some limited uh, access components from a residential standpoint. And so this map really does a good job kind of showing what we're looking at here. So the, the subject, um, rezone proposal in the developable portion of the property is right about here. And so it's really just a quarter of the subject property. And when you look at it, it really is an island surrounded by critical areas um, to the east. We have uh, Bear Creek and wetlands, um, categories uh, two and three. Down to the south of us, we do have our north um, and regional stormwater facility. And then north of the site, we have um, both two uh, a public and a private wetland mitigation site. Um, once we look onto the other portion, the western portion of the subject, or the, the subject owner, the property owner's um, 
property within the industrial zoning designation, there's also a significant portion there that had, has critical areas and associated buffers on it. And so from a residential standpoint, we really only have potential for about 15 units on this portion of the property. And when you look at the um, requirements in order to develop that under residential zoning, they'd ultimately be required to develop June Road right-of-way through um, wetland areas, uh, installation of a sewer main throughout that area. So from staff's perspective, we think that it's, it's very unlikely from an economic feasibility standpoint that the subject property would be developed for residential single uses. Therefore, we, we think it makes a lot more sense to utilize that for industrial purposes given the limited access, limited access components as well as critical areas ultimately surrounding the subject property. So staff has reviewed the proposal for consistency with both the comprehensive plan amendment requirements and the rezone requirements under the municipal code, and we do believe that it meets those requirements. Um, the proposal in this case would uh, promote logical expansion of the industrial zoning. It would help encourage economic development and supporting jobs. It would enable the property owner to develop the site under um, one single zoning classification, which would organize and simplify uh, the development regulations and permitting process for the for pr proposed future development. And it, it ultimately would maximize efficient use of land. Um, we feel that if the comp plan amendment does not move forward, it's very likely that this portion of the property would remain undeveloped. We have critical areas ordinances in place, so we feel confident that critical areas will be protected through the development process. We just feel that this land could potentially sit vacant and under underused if if it's not rezoned. So with that, um, staff makes a recommendation as uh, with the Planning Commission that um, City Council approve the proposed um, rezone. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, Council Members, any questions? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the public hearing. Right now we have one person signed up, Mr. Ron Jepson, if you'd come forward. My name is Ron Jepson, engineer. I'm representing the owner of the whole 20-acre parcel. And as you can see, um, it's a very limited uh, development parcel, about maybe three acres of the 10, two and a half maybe uh, could be developed. However, it is landlocked and access would have to come through the industrial site to get to it. Um, so I would like to recommend that you accept the Planning Commission. It worked the last time. <coughs> and uh, there has been no opposition to it. And uh, I think what happens is, uh, as was stated in the last situation, the line be being a single family zoning line trips setbacks on the industrial use that they have to comply with and then it could be interpreted that any use on the single family parcel that would support the industrial use may not be legitimate. And I'm referring to maybe a stormwater dispersion or a drain field or anything like that that would support the industrial could technically be said it's illegal in the single family zone. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, recommend approval. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to come forward to speak to this matter? Go ahead. Just introduce your name, please, before you comment. Hello, my name is Yoshi Ravel. Uh, thank you, members of the audience, members of staff, city council, Madam Mayor. Um, I think I heard the word underutilized. I'm sorry. But there are plants and animals that live on that piece of land. And we tend to steamroll over them. And we think that that's acceptable, basically because they can't come and speak at a city council meeting and say, you know, we live in this place. And the more we neglect the needs of the plants and animals of this world, we start destroying the world that we live on and eventually it gets to us. That's what climate change is about. 
we're ignoring the fact that we're steamrolling our planet. Climate change is going to be nasty if we don't slow down. I thank you all for listening, and I wish you all health and well-being. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshi. Does anyone else like to come forward to speak on this issue? Lori, just come forward and then state your name and go ahead. My name is Laura Roz, and I just want to say, why would you want to put pollution where there is nature? That just, it, it doesn't make any sense, and I just don't think we should put pollution where, I know we need jobs and things like that, but why pollute a land that doesn't need to be polluted? And um, I don't think this should happen. Thank you. Anyone else like to come forward to speak to this? Oh, by the way, uh, we, we have some rules of decorum in here, and one of those is we don't boo, nor do we clap or cheer people. We try to kind of keep it neutral. We'll listen to what you have to say. Um, is there anybody else who would like to come forward and speak on this issue? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring the public hearing to a close, bring it back to the City Council. Anyone Move like? approval. Second. We have a motion to second. This is a motion to approve a comprehensive plan amendment change in a rezone of Porsche property located within Area 20 from residential signal to industrial plans. Any discussion of the motion? April? So uh, I'm, I'm supportive of the project. I just have a couple of questions in regards to housing. So we lose 15 units here. And on the last one, I think there was about seven units, it sounded like. So we look at these individually, but there is a cumulative effect. And at, do we keep track of that? Because our comprehensive plan based our population projections on a lot of these properties that we knew were encumbered. So we, of course, put less property um, units toward those. So at what point does something trip to let us know that over time we have changed enough zoning that we're now not going to be meeting our comprehensive plan goals? Um, if I might respond, a uh, couple of things. First, we do a buildable lands analysis, which assesses all of the lands, to takes out the critical areas, and gives us a number. But we know things like this do happen, so we put in a market factor that gives us a cushion of units that are usually 20 to 25 percent more than we typically would need, because that could represent both units like this that fall out when you do more detailed analysis, or other units that may not develop in the market. So we always have a surplus to allow for minor fluctuations. That being said, we keep close tabs on development patterns and actual development and reassess the numbers frequently. Because if we find ourselves having an incorrect assumption, we'd want to adjust it. So in this case, I feel fairly uh, confident we've uh, got uh, headroom significant headroom at this point in time since we just did that analysis for the recent comp plan adoption and we will reassess um, probably uh, within a year's time to see where we come up. Terry? Yeah, uh, kind of relating to what April was asking about just as a point of history, Gene will remember it but not, I don't, maybe no one that's right in here. When we first brought that area of Cordata into the city, a lot of it had, was zoned light industrial. And we had some real battles in here about rezoning that light industrial property into housing property. So there has been, we lost a lot of light industrial property in that area that went towards housing. And so when I saw that, I thought, well, this balances a little bit, plus these properties, just because the acreage says you could it says seven houses or whatever. Given wetlands and accessibility doesn't mean we're losing seven, seven home sites or 30 home sites or whatever it is. There's a lot of it you're not going to be able to develop into individual home sites. Anyway, so I'll definitely, I think I'll uh, approve this one. Anyone else? Well, I would like to say that um, I really do appreciate the fact that this is being uh, changed to allow for more industrial and commercial development. I really worry about us having a balanced approach to expanding. Oh, jeez. Hello. Make sure you turn off your phone. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Round um, of drinking. It's good for everybody. <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> You're in trouble now, buddy. So I, I'd like to say that I, I, we need a balanced approach, and I sometimes worry that we get too much uh, residential development 
not always in the right places. This area is already great for light industrial development. Um, most of this property is encumbered, but I think there's a chance to aid in the commercial development of this area. And one of the reasons why I'm so keen on maximizing the utilization of land that's already within the city limits is I want to avoid sprawl. I want to avoid expanding our urban boundaries. I want to avoid low density or any density development out in the areas that are outside the city limits. If we can stay within the city limits where our carbon footprint is lower, where our transportation impacts are lower, where travel distances are fewer, we are, you know, trying as best we can to um, reduce the impacts of the environment around us. I'm not saying this is environmentally friendly, but there are far less friendly ways we could develop, and I want to resist those, and so I will take the better path when given to me. So that's one reason I'm supporting this comp plan and rezone change. Is there any further discussion on this issue? Okay. So the motion before us is to approve a comprehensive plan change and a rezone in a portion of property located in Area 20. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. That concludes our two public hearings. We will now go on to the 15-minute public comment period. We have several people signed up. It might take a little longer than 15 minutes, but I think we can get through this if everyone does a good job of trying to abide by the three-minute limit. We have a sign over here which indicates your three minutes. When you hear the bell go off, that actually means you have 30 seconds to wrap up your comment, so you can keep talking. Um, the first name up here is Mr. Joseph McDonald, and then Joe McIntyre-Witt will be second. Joseph, would you like to come forward? My name is Joseph McDonald, and you know I have a speech impediment. I would like to see the city council candidates have in the open forum and nationally be televised. I have a few questions I would like to ask the, to be asked by, to the candidates. One of them being, do you believe in love or do you believe in hate? I'm sure other people have their questions Excuse too. Me, Joseph, um, we have a, a rule, a state law actually, that does not allow this forum to be used for campaigning or candidate issues. If you can reframe your questions as general issues to the public rather than as candidate questions, you can just go ahead. Okay, I, I would just like an open forum. An open forum on the issues. Thank you, sir. Um, after that is uh, Jill McIntyre Witt, followed by Ben Larson and Gary Pedersen. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Jill McIntyre Witt. I don't come here that often, uh, but when I do, I, I, I want to ask, ask you some very tough questions. Uh, I want to appreciate what you said, Michael, about thinking about the climate impacts, the decisions. I've asked that years ago to put a carbon footprint on every decision the city council makes, so I appreciate that you guys are looking into that. Uh, I'm here because of what happened last week. Uh, our president uh, wants to pull out or said we're going to pull out of the Paris Agreement. I've been spending the last two years working on climate justice uh, and made a field manual to help uh, people urge governments to take bolder action on climate change because the Paris Agreement does not meet our current targets to lower our carbon emissions to what the agreement says, 1.5 degrees Celsius. So the targets are off, so we need to urge local governments to take stronger action. I appreciate today that you took a 7-0 vote to sign on to a letter saying that we support the Paris Agreement. However, I'm here to ask you to take bolder action. So while I appreciate that and it's very necessary and we are a city that votes 7-0 to sign on to something like that, it's easy for us to do that. Um, what seems to be hard for us is to put out a climate action plan. We've been working hard to revise it. It needs further revision. It's going to be coming out soon. I have been talking with the folks that work on that. Uh, I'm here to ask that we act on climate and put numbers to the actions that we can take as a city. Uh, there are cities across the, the country that have committed to 100% renewable energy at various years, say 2025, 2030, 2035, 2050. I want to ask the city to commit, uh, make 100% commitment uh, to doing so by 2030. And that would be actually putting targets into place to make that happen, as well as um, reporting back to the citizens um, that we're actually 
hitting those targets as we move forward uh, post uh, announcement last week um, and <laughs> where we need to go moving forward. The bottom line is we need to move forward faster. Uh, I'm asking the citizens of Bellingham, if you're watching tonight, to come out to the farmer's market this weekend. I volunteer with 350.org and they've asked all the local city chapters to have an action on June 10th to urge that their cities act on climate. So I'm asking people to come out to the farmer's market to um, sign on to support that we uh, make um, targets, that we take action. I wanted to uh, let you know there are cities that have already hit 100% renewable energy right now uh, and there are cities that have committed to doing that. I don't see why we can't have Bellingham on the list of cities committing to that. Um, I do want to mention, so Sierra Club is running a campaign. There are other uh, ways to join in on this. We have the, um, oh, that 30 seconds went fast, really? Okay, well, the Mayor's National Climate Action Agenda, look it up. And I would like to see if we can get a Citizens um, Climate Justice Committee formed. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Next up would be Ben Larson, followed by Gary Pedersen, and then Nancy Amol, Amoli, Aroli. Hello, council members. My name is Ben Larson. I'm a member of the Bellingham Tenants Union, BTU. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking City Council for meeting today uh, to talk about housing and uh, housing affordability in Bellingham. I'd also like to recognize and thank many of the community members who are here uh, who uh, brought awareness to homelessness during the Peace Out protest this weekend as well. Uh, as you know, housing is a crucial issue for residents of Bellingham. Uh, the home is a wellspring of personhood. It is where identity takes root and blossoms, where as children we imagine, play, and question, and as adolescents we retreat and try. As we grow older, we hope to settle into a place to raise a family or pursue work. When we want to understand ourselves, we often begin by considering the home in which we were raised. Uh, civic life, too, begins at home, allowing us to plant roots and take ownership over our community, participate in local politics, and reach out to neighbors in the spirit of solidarity and generosity. Uh, this makes it all the more important uh, that the barriers to housing are lowered in Bellingham. Large sums paid in fees can be prohibitive to many uh, would-be tenants and perpetuate homelessness in our city. Income discrimination makes affordable sh uh, affording shelter even more difficult for those receiving housing assistance and our government's efforts to address homelessness less effective. Finally, education regarding renters' rights and responsibilities is extremely important for protecting the health, safety, and economic security of tenants in our city. I urge the City Council to develop ordinances to address these issues, and I thank you for your time and your continued efforts on housing and housing affordability in Bellingham. Thank you, Ben. And next up is Gary Pedersen, followed by Nancy, I'm sorry, Emily, perhaps, and then Galen Hertz. Um, thank you. My name's Gary Pedersen. I have uh, the one that passed this out to you earlier. I'll make this short and sweet. The first page, as you can see, is basically the landlord-tenant law. That's what I'm here to speak about. I'm happy that earlier today I was at the council board meeting and they really were energetic in bringing that up and looking into doing ways to do things. There's a lot of good ideas that came up and I'm looking forward to more things going on. I am a member of the Bellingham Tenants Union also. Um, so I want the first page is pretty much self-explanatory. Basically what it says, it's in a nutshell, is right now Tenants have a 20-day written notice over their heads because there's nothing in the state law that says landlords can't do anything about it. They can just give you a notice and you're gone. The second page is facts. I'll start with the first one. This was from 2016. 41% um, of everybody's income is going to their housing. It should be below 28%. You all know that. According to Zillow, those are facts about Bellingham and Whatcom County housing. And if you look at the third page, Real quickly, you can see on item two, the average cost for, for di the disabled people and stuff, even on a single person at $900, how are they gonna pay $1,500 a month for rent? You know, this is, these are things that are undisputed. The University of Washington came up with a study showing 40% or more people are living in their cars, increasing 10% homelessness. The third page is basically our tenant recourse. All we're trying to ask is, why is it landlords only offer month to month? Why can't we get a three-month lease? It's not asking too much 
they say, well, you can't do that. I've talked to council members in Everett, Seattle, all the way up the county, and I've looked into this. It, basically, you can pass a resolution asking or demanding that if you are a landlord in the, state, in the city, you have to offer a three-month lease to people. Another thing we'd like to see is that if you're going to evict somebody, you have to give a notice. As the state law reads now, they don't have to give you a notice. If Mayor Lindley likes my apartment, she just has to go to Michael, my landlord, say, I want Gary's apartment. He puts a 20-day notice on my door. I got to find some place to live. I guarantee you this isn't 1970 people where we, back then, yes, we went to the apartments to get away from our parents to parties. The landlords were going to take our deposits. We expected that. This is the 2000s where now we live in the apartments and they're our homes. We need some security. Three months isn't asking much. If somebody is trashing the apartment, the landlord could get rid of them in three months' time. But for those of us that pay our rent on time, we'd like a little bit of security. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Next up, uh, Nancy, and if you could say your last name properly, that'd be great. Then followed by Galen, Nancy and then Emma. Peyton A. Cree, I'm gonna say. Go ahead. Um, the next person is pa Caitlin and then Peyton. So go ahead, please. Hi. Um, I'm Nancy Amel, and um, I am currently homeless. I um, always pay my rent on time. I don't drink, smoke, party, or do drugs. I don't have a criminal record. The reason I am homeless is because the property management company has decided they were going to remodel all the units. So I was given 20 day notice to get out. That was on October, um, excuse me, April 6th. I was able to get an additional month, but as of the 31st of May, I'm homeless and couch surfing. Um, I can't be out on the street. I have various medical issues that would make it impossible for me to like be out on the street. Um, the try and I should make clear that I do have a housing voucher, housing choice voucher, otherwise known as Section 8. Um, but trying to find an apartment within the rental limits that are set forth, which for a one-bedroom apartment is somewhere around 750 to 760 a month. Now, occasionally, there, there, I will find a listing for something underneath that, under, within those limits, or, or below, but they won't take Section 8 because it's a voluntary program. Um, I need an apartment where I don't have to share laundry facilities because I'm a mean compromised, where either it has a washer and dryer, a washer and dryer hookup, or at least enough square footage where I can get some kind of portable washer to wash my clothes. Um, and I've been looking solidly now for two months. Haven't found anything. It just uh, uh, for these prices, you know, 750, 760, they don't exist. And if they do, they don't take housing. Um, so it's basically legalized discrimination against people who hold housing vouchers. Um, and there, there are a few cities, Seattle, Tequila, I believe, Bellevue, where they have made it illegal to discriminate against people on, with housing vouchers if a, a landlord's apartment falls within the rental limits that's covered by a voucher. And it's pretty obvious to me that I'm not alone. There were other people in the building that were also disabled and kicked out, that there needs to be something. Well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, Galen, next, followed by Peyton Cree, I'm going to say, and then Russ Sepienza. Good evening, Council. My name is Galen Herz, and I'm the Western Associated Students Local Issues Coordinator. I'd like to first express my respect 
um, and support for the organizers of Peace Out. And I'd also like to thank the council and the mayor for their work on the low barrier shelter and the work sessions on renter barriers. Um, I would like to speak to you all today about how our city's housing affordability challenge is interlinked with the climate crisis, as are the solutions. This past Thursday, when I should have been studying for finals, I was watching the world's reaction to President Trump's decision to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Trump has betrayed future generations and our planet. I was glad to see that many elected leaders, such as our governor and over 180 mayors, have pledged to continue to follow the Paris Accord. Our city's own climate champion, Pinky Vargas, has brought forward a motion to do the same. But what do these pledges mean when it comes to concrete policy and action in our city? Our city's climate action plan states roughly 42% of our emissions come from transportation and 48% come from buildings, half residential and half commercial. To reduce emissions, we need dense, bike and walkable, mixed income neighborhoods served by transit. It's no secret that Bellingham has skyrocketing home values and rents, more of our neighbors are experiencing homelessness, and more working class residents are being pushed out to areas with more affordable housing, like Ferndale and Blaine. These residents then commute farther for work, driving up carbon emissions. If we reject urban sprawl because we value farmland, mountain biking at Galbraith, and the natural beauty of our surroundings, we must allow for density. There is growing demand among my generation, young families, and seniors for missing middle housing, such as row houses, cottage housing, and mother-in-law units. These homes are more affordable, allow more families to live near parks and schools, and are more energy efficient. The EPA concluded in a 2011 report titled, Location Efficiency and Housing Type, Boiling It Down to BTUs, Housing type is a very significant, and this is quote, housing type is a very significant determinant of energy consumption. Fairly substantial differences are seen in detached versus attached homes, but the most striking difference is the variation in energy use between single family detached homes and multifamily homes due to the inherent efficiencies from more compact size and shared walls among units. I hope you all will support well-designed infill in every neighborhood to allow for dense, bike walkable, economically diverse neighborhoods served by transit. Our community has been a leader on climate issues, especially when it comes to saying no to fossil fuel projects. Now more than ever, I hope the community is ready to say yes for solutions to housing affordability and a low carbon city. Thank you. Thank you, Galen. Uh, Peyton is next, followed by Russ Sapienza and then uh, Laura Ross. Uh, hi, my name is Peyton Acri, and I am just a student and a resident here in Bellingham. And recently I did a project on homelessness here, and I found um, some evidence. But what I was wondering is what Bellingham is doing um, to help those who are homeless get into housing that is more permanent and not just temporary help. So I was wondering if how Bellingham is using, if they thought about using rapid rehousing, which um, is quickly moves homeless people into permanent housing by providing temporary rent, subsidies, and housing-focused case management while the household does not have to leave when services end. Also, transitional housing with provides housing for no longer than 24 months and is designed to move people ex, um, experiencing homelessness into permanent housing. Now, um, rehousing uh, for beds and slots, um, I've seen 12,359 beds for that, and the cost per day would be $26, which is a pretty low cost. And then for a successful exit, exit would be $4,000. As well as for transitional housing, it's a little bit more with um, 7,000 beds and cost per day would be $45 and a cost for successful exit would be $15,000. So that is all I have to say, so thank you. Thank you, Peyton. Uh, Russ is next, followed by Laura Ross and then Michael Zick. Good evening, council members. My name is Russ Sapienza and I've worked as a, what was called a peer advocate and then a peer counselor at Rainbow Recovery Center, and for a long time. And throughout my career, I have noticed so many people who are trying desperately to get into housing, but have not been able to, to uh, procure it, primarily because the rents are too high, many um, folks have criminal records, and many of them cannot even afford the application fee. And earlier, one of your speakers mentioned that 
sometimes it takes almost half the person's entire income just to pay for the rent. I find that unacceptable. And, you know, I'm on disability myself, and I feel that it's important for all of us to understand that once a certain group of people, that is, people with mental health issues or developmental issues, if they don't get housing, what does that mean for the rest of us? And I think a lot of you folks in the audience will will hopefully ask that question as well. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Uh, Laura Ross is next, followed by Michael Zick and then Rick Carroll. Hi, my name is Laura Ross, and I just want to let you know that I'm homeless because of domestic violence. This I want to hand to you guys. This is um, uh, wishes for the, from the homeless and what we need. Thank you. I don't think I have enough time for my three minutes. Hi, my name is Laura Rods. I started Peace Out a year ago because we all need a home. Meetings are popping up all over with people wanting to help with the homeless. Um, uh, but to actually do, to set out to do something, to, to help someone, oh, I'm sorry. You're fine. But to actually do what you set out to do, to help someone that is less fortunate than yourself, to go out of your way for someone who is in need, to make the difference, to change a person's life for the better. Well, that's why I've asked all of us to come together this weekend um, uh, and, and, for, and for the turnout this year. I've had, I had 14 more tents than I did last year. Um, and uh, my gratitude to the people of Bellingham that su supplied the food and the water and stuff for peace out. Um, uh, uh, because we all need a home. Thanks, because we all have feelings. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Laura. Uh, next up is Michael Zick, followed by Rick Carroll, and then uh, Jay Griffin, please. Hello, the City Council. Hello, Mayor, people of Bellingham. I just want to say I love this town. I don't consider myself homeless. I don't consider myself a transient. I consider myself without shelter. Uh, Bellingham is my home. I've lived here almost my entire life. Um, there's various things with the housing market that make it difficult for me, which I'm on SSI, Section 8. And you know, um, Tony Castle with the Housing Authority, he's having a lottery, maybe a possible 2,000 more uh, vouchers are going to be distributed uh, when the market's already flooded with ones that can't be used. I'm currently at the drop-in center. Uh, there's various issues going on there that, you know, make it difficult to be a stable place for someone in our, my position anyway. You know, we talk about the trash and the litter and the unsanitary bathroom going into the creek and the watersheds and stuff. You know, when I, I see that the Maritime Heritage Park it's the only uh, bathroom in Whatcom County where, the, where it's locked up and we are the homeless community that we don't have access to it. Uh, what, you know, you can go to Lake Patton, you can take a shower, uh, you can go to any other park run by the Parks and Recreation Department in Whatcom County and the bathrooms are open um, all day until the sun goes down. The Maritime Heritage Park is the only one that's locked and not unavailable to us. Um, you know, and there's the cameras and the other things that make it uncomfortable. You know, I, I know that there are homeless problems and, you know, people do things in the bathrooms they shouldn't be, but, you know, when you go in the, the bush and urinate on a tree, you know, they're, they're, you may get a charge that you may not like. It has nothing to do with uh, urinating in public. A, a dog has more rights than a homeless person is the way I see it right now. So I just wanted to say that piece, but I appreciate the efforts being taken place. And um, I hope that, you know, a land or a park or a space for the homeless community can be set aside just like we did here today. You know, we, we clean up after ourselves. You know, we have, we're respectful of the land. We're respectful of the people around us. Um, it's just a matter of having a place to pitch a tent would even be better than some of the situations that we have to deal with at places like the drop-in center or the mission or the YMCA or 
you know, church floor um, or sending crews to, to scout out litter and pick up trash all over the community when it can be done at one place in one location it would be a lot more economical feasible than, than hunting all over the place for us that's all I wanted to say but I, thank you I know you're, you're working on it Thank you, Michael. Up next is Rick Carroll, followed by uh, Jade Griffin, and then Rihanna Johnston. It's hard to explain about its homeless people. We're, uh, we're everywhere in every city. Um, we all have problems, different problems, uh, and it's like nobody can hear us because we don't actually talk about it to anybody because of um, it's just a, a quiet thing to, about us homeless people and uh, my main concern in Bellingham is uh, we're not very picky people but um, I don't know who runs the mission or the drop-in center uh, I, I've been to uh, the, the health department and the city hall and the, uh, the mission, and I, and I don't know how to uh, help us homeless people. The, um, I've heard of several people uh, uh, get heartburn from the food that we eat. I'm not saying we're, we're complaining. Uh, on uh, our food, I guess I kind of am, but um, I wish things could be better for us here in Bellingham, and I know it can be if if somebody could help us, and and I know it, it's the money thing, but we need more help here in Bellingham, and I, I appreciate it if uh, somebody could. St st stand up for us a little better on how we're being treated. Uh, the drop-in center, uh, uh, disabled people, is hard for us to get up off the um, floor where we sleep. And, uh, and if there's something we could do about it as homeless people, you know, it's hard for us to uh, ask for help, you know, but um, if there, if there's, I don't know how other cities work, but I wish our cities could work a little better for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, Jade, you're up next, followed by Rihanna Johnston, then April McCabe. Uh, I'm Jade, and um, <clears throat> just a um, couple of the things I wanted to ask about was, um, you know, like everybody else, you know, something to be done about the housing situation as far as affordability, um, as well as. Um, the fact that uh, public restrooms are really hard to come by for the transgender community. Um, a lot of places won't let us use ones where we feel comfortable, so we don't use them at all. And it ends up uh, causing us uh, health problems because we have to wait until we can find one we can use. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Jade. Uh, Rihanna Johnston is next, by fellow April McCabe, and then the last person to speak will be Yoshi again. Uh, hi, my name is Rihanna Johnston. I'm an organizer for the Bellingham Tenants Union. Um, I'd first like to just express support and thanks to all the folks that have been doing the piece out. Um, I think it's really important and it's super great that you're drawing attention to these issues. Um, I'd also like to thank the City Council for your efforts um, in addressing housing and housing affordability issues. Um, I was at the working group this morning and I really appreciated comments that were made and your effort to kind of take all perspectives um, into account and uh, really start addressing these issues. Um, BDU and I personally strongly support preventing source of income discrimination. We think that's a really big um, step forward. Um, we also support reducing move-in fee barriers, such as I think what was mentioned earlier today, uh, repeated application fees when you're applying for housing, um, and then just altogether high amounts of um, initial upfront fees that you have to pay before you can even get into your uh, hopeful 
rental unit. Um, and then also just increasing tenant access to basic uh, tenant rights information. Uh, we've spoken about this before, but providing tenants on move-in with a basic packet of information um, about both their rights and their responsibilities, I think will protect both tenants and landlords in the long term. Um, and that's a, an important step forward for our community. Um, and, um, Oh, and also including voter rights information as well. Tenants um, should have access to that information. We're important members of the community uh, in all other ways, and having access to our voting rights is also very important. Um, but yeah, so thank you for your efforts on these issues, and we look forward to continue to working on them with you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rihanna, followed by April McCabe, and then uh, Yoshi will be last to speak. Hi, my name is April McCabe. I am a housing case manager at Opportunity Council. I specifically work with women and children that are survivors of domestic violence. Um, currently, I have uh, quite a few clients that have the privilege of holding a voucher, Section 8 choice voucher. Um, but it has been so hard to um, walk with them and support them in trying to find housing when there is none. Um, when so many landlords and property managers just don't even um, let them tell them their background or who they are um, and simply say no housing assistance. Um, these I've seen already a few families that I've worked with um, get so far, um, reach a stable spot, um, maybe gain part-time employment, um, make huge leaps, but then have lost their housing voucher because of that 90-day limit. Um, I hope moving forward that you all will be supporting um, banning income discrimination because that is definitely um, a huge, huge barrier. And though certainly not the solution um, to ending homelessness, it is certainly a good step. So thank you for your support and listening and also for everyone's support in the peace out as well. Okay, thank you. And I think up next is April, or that was April. Yeah. Okay, so April. Uh, Yoshi. <laughs> there's, sorry, there's a lot of them out there. <laughs> thank you. My name is Yoshi Ravel. Um, thank you, members of the audience and staff, members of the city council, Madam Mayor, people of Bellingham. Um, I've mentioned it in here before, uh, but it's worth repeating. As long as there's one homeless person, we're all homeless. We're all homeless right now. We live in big, huge houses, and we think we have a home. We don't. We have a prison. We go to our homes and we hide there. We hide from the problems of the world. We hide from the problems of the homeless. We have our prison where we think we're safe. We're not. As long as there is one homeless person, we're all homeless because we're afraid up here, because we're not living from our hearts. If we don't live from our hearts, we're all homeless. That's true all around the world. We chase the wrong things. There's a thing called a money drunk. We think money is going to solve our problems, and we get drunk on it. Money is not going to solve our problems. If we don't live from our hearts, we're all lost. We own nothing, absolutely nothing. To the extent that we think we own anything, we're prisoners. We are prisoners in the things that we own. This is all a gift. We own none of it. In the messianic age, there will be no such thing as money. There will be no such thing as ownership. We will all understand that this is a gift, and we will serve each other continually. There will be no such thing as need, because we will be serving each other the way we are made to serve each other, gratefully, and grateful for this gift that we have. I thank you all for allowing me to speak. And I wish you all health and well-being. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. That brings to an end our 15 minute public comment period. Thank you everyone for your comments. Oh, do we have more time? Okay, go ahead, sir. No, no, we're a little beyond our allotment, but go for it. Sorry about that. Okay, go ahead and state your name, please, though. Brad Miller here with uh, 3229 North Shore Road. Thank you again, Mayors of the Council and Mayor Linville and others for the chance to talk tonight. I don't want to diminish one bit of what was said before me, but I did bring, I want to bring something to your attention and ask a question or two. I received a piece of mail over the weekend from the Lake Whatcom Water and Sewer District inviting me to a meeting on the 20th of June where they were going to expand on and report on their feasibility study to extend water to the entire end of North Shore Road and consolidate smaller water districts. Um, I just wondered if how many of you might be aware of that, and I'll just continue to ask a question in a different way. One of the um, things extrapolated in the report that I saw was that they're planning by the consolidation of smaller water districts to be able to serve a maximum 280 some homes and then an additional 500 and some homes in the area from those water districts to the end of North Shore Road. That's about just under 800 new residential units that they are planning for by these plans. And I just would like to see if you have a show of hands or something, how many of you might even been aware that that process was going on or the count of the district was contemplating yeah, that kind sir, of project? In the public comment period, we have a rule where we listen, we don't okay. comment, but if you would please email us you can email the entire city council at ccmail at cob.org. I think okay. we'd be happy to give you a reply that way. Wonderful. Okay, good. Thank you. Keep it brief. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay, so now we'll go into our regular meeting, which has consists of reports from our standing committees. This morning, the planning committee met, and its chairperson is Gene Knudsen. Thank you very much, Michael. This morning, we had a... Council Committee Work Session on Residential Barrier Concerns, Part 2. This morning uh, with me on the committee was Dan Hamill and April Barker. Also this morning we had Mayor Linville, we had Rick Seppler from Planning, we had Kurt Nabafeld from Planning, we had Brian Heinrich from the Mayor's Office. We heard from uh, a few landlords today. We heard from Phyllis McKee, who's a landlord and a property owner here in Bellingham. We heard from Doug White, the owner of Windermere, who has a lot of um, rental uh, uh, units here in Bellingham. And we also heard from Adriana Hulkensberger. I'm probably butchering up her last name. Um, she is the Opportunity Council Center for the Homeless. We had a great discussion. We talked about income discrimination. We talked about moving fees, tenants' rights, responsibilities, and, uh, and putting that into one packet. We had a great discussion. Our next uh, work session is going to be talking about uh, one of the property owners today talked about the uh, hurdles they have with insurance. So we're going to have somebody from that industry come and talk to us next time. And we're also going to have a lot of data from what other cities are doing on this topic from Mark Gardner. April or Dan, is there any other thing that you want to bring up? No, I, I, think, that, I think we had a good discussion, a pretty robust discussion today. I, at some point, I would like to talk with nonprofit housing developers okay. like Colson CLT, Mercy sure. Housing, um, Habitat for Humanity. But, but I know that this is an ongoing yep. process. So. It's ongoing. Yeah. Okay. End of committee, Mr. President. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, our next committee to meet this afternoon at one o'clock was Public Works and Public Safety, and that's chaired by Councilor Terry Mortiman. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we had one item before us today. That was a noise variance request from the Washington State Department of Transportation, or WASHDA, for I-5 cable barrier upgrade project. The Washington State Department of Transportation is requesting 12 non-consecutive nights of variance from the requirements of the city's noise ordinance for a safety project on Interstate uh, I-5. The noise variance is uh, requested to allow WashDOT contractors to work nights on I-5 within the jurisdiction of the City of Bellingham between the inclusive dates of October 1st, 2017 and April 30th, 2018. The project encompasses two sections from uh, Bellingham uh, Section 8, approximately Donovan Avenue to Lakeway Drive, and Section 9, approximately Sunset Drive to Bakerview Road. Uh, Jay uh, Dry, uh, Washdot Assistant Regional Administrator for our region, was in attendance uh, for the meeting for the council. Uh, this noise ordinance, they had indicated, isn't going to be uh, t 
typical noise like grinding or anything. They're going to uh, put in uh, areas where you've got three uh, wire guide uh, protective uh, guards. They're going to increase that uh, for strength in, in the uh, center areas. Uh, uh, so the committee recommended approval and I so move. Second. Okay, we have a motion before us to approve a noise variance requested by the Washington Department of Transportation for their uh, project for upgrading the cable barriers. Any further discussion? All those in favor of granting the variance signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. And the committee entering the room. Thank you. We next go on to the Finance and Personnel Committee. Uh, Council Member Roxanne Murphy is the chair. Thank you, Mr. President. We had two agenda items. The first was an ordinance amending the 2017-2018 budget, recognizing property tax revenues in the Greenways Fund, appropriating a portion for capital maintenance and increasing ending reserves. So basically what happened is voters kindly passed the Greenways levy in our community, but that happened after we had submitted our city's budget. So what we're doing right now is we approve, we unanimously supported the appropriation of funding and this will go on to help with different capital improvement projects throughout our park system. So the community unanimously recommended support and I so move. Second. We have a motion before us to amend the budget to realize the revenues from the Greenways Fund in particular to have to do with our um, increased uh, maintenance um, program. Any further discussion on this budget amendment? All those in favor of passing the ordinance signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That also passes unanimously. Thank you. The second item was a 2017 financial report. Things are going quite well. I encourage people to go back and look at the presentation that happened earlier this afternoon to hear some of this good and sometimes static news. <laughs> End of committee. Thank you very much. The next committee that met was Parks and Recreation. April Barker is the chair of that committee. We had one item for committee today. Um, let's see, I was joined by Councilmember uh, Pinky and Roxanne. It was approval of the name of the new uh, park on Wacom Waterway. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm just kidding. That just, just. <laughs> Vargas and Murphy, Councilmember Vargas and Murphy. Um, so it was approval of the name of the new park on the Wacom Waterway. Uh, the following. Uh, it's a public process detailed in the attached policy, so you can read that if you'd like to go back and you can also watch the small discussion that we had. Uh, the Parks and Recre Recreation Advisory Board recommends the name Waypoint Park and Bay Heart Park to Council for consideration for the naming of the new waterfront park, which has temporarily been referred to as Wacom Waterway Park. City staff and the mayor recommended the name Waypoint. This is also the name of the artist, uh, the, the name of the acid ball that was given by the artist, um, which will be a central feature of the park. Uh, one of the, the meaning for Waypoint, for those of you that uh, don't know, is a stopping place on a journey, and it seems very appropriate for Bellingham and for the park. So uh, we had unanimous uh, recommendation for council to approve, and I so move. Second. We have a motion to approve the new name for the park on the Wacom Waterway to call it Waypoint Park. Is there any further discussion? Some decisions are bigger than others. Yeah. <laughs> this one's going to last. All those in favor of approving the name change signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Close. Okay, we got a new park. Now if we just figure out what to call the Cordata Parks. And Plural. Committee. Thank you. Uh, the next committee, the final committee is the Committee of the Whole. We had four items before us. The first one was site selection criteria for potential locations for a low barrier homeless shelter and day center to be operated by the Lighthouse Mission Ministries. The city has been working cooperatively with the Lighthouse Mission Ministries to identify potential sites that could accommodate an easy access shelter to serve the community. The mission has identified operational criteria that frame their willingness to participate. Additionally, staff have also identified several regulatory and policy criteria that help to um, that need to be met to establish the um, potential new location. I'm going to turn the page approximately 120. There was a list of seven location criteria um, and then some further site requirements and building requirements. The discussion this afternoon from the uh, 
the staff and, and the mayor indicated that these criteria are not necessarily all equally weighted or all equally set in stone. They're the beginning point to try to identify a property that works well with our partner, which at this point is our only partner who stepped up to do independent fundraising for a low barrier shelter. Um, I believe the plan is basically to try to make this work and realizing that those criteria and our plans may need to change, um, but right now we've identified tentatively a general radius around the current facilities, which would allow the Lighthouse Mission to realize some operational cost savings if they operate another facility which is nearby their current facility. Um, I hope that's a fair characterization. Is there any comments, Kelly or Council? No, that sounds okay. That was what it was. So that was for information only. Those efforts are ongoing. The next item was a discussion of the interlocal jail facility finance and use agreement. This is an agreement that describes the financial commitments, uh, including the use of sales tax and cost allocations for each participating jurisdiction in the construction and the operating of the new county jail. Uh, the, this JFFUA also describes the uses of the proposed facility as well as certain operational aspects of the existing facility. Um, last Tuesday, May 30th, the Whatcom County Council affirmed the size at 440 beds plus or minus three for the main jail. Um, this afternoon we discussed it and there was a motion to uh, table voting on this action until after the county had had um, their hearing, which is scheduled for next week. Uh, the city attorney wanted us to clarify the motion to make, to indicate exactly when it would come back. Would it be after the hearing? just the very next meeting that we have after the hearing or after the council's next opportunity to act? Hmm. I'm not sure. I, all I know is af after that, so when we have an opportunity at, at our meeting to be able to act on it. Yeah. So it would be the, at least the meeting after that. Council Member Hamill? Hearings. Can you, just, can you clarify what the last part of your statement? Sure. So normally when you table something, there has to be a trigger to bring it off of the table. And the motion this afternoon had to do with waiting until after the county had had their hearing, but that could mean the, the, our very next meeting, which might be before the county had a chance to act. I, I think the city attorney wanted us to clarify exactly when that would come back to be put on our agenda. Gene. It's my understanding that they're going to have a hearing on the t uh, 13th. And vote that night. So our next meeting is the 19th. So I don't know why we wouldn't take action after we hear what they do. Okay, you're understanding is they will be voting that night. No. I think that would be fine to bring it back then, and we can decide if we want to take action or not. Yeah. Okay. Right. Dan, I have no disagreement with that. I think that's fine. Yeah. Okay, um, Mr. Rufato, do, do you think the motion is now uh, adequately clarified? So it sounds like we'd bring it back at our next meeting following the hearing and be put on the committee of the whole. Yeah, uh, in terms of process, yes. There is still an underlying question. I don't know that the county council is necessarily going to take another vote. I don't know that they're, I don't know that they that's are. That's what I've been told. That's, so, that's, I'm just saying that. So, okay. Yeah, they don't. Um, Pinky, and then April. I just had a quick question about what the timeline was that is when we have to, the latest, to pass it back to the county. Just curious on that timeline. That's end of July. I know we talked about that this morning. Right. The, the, that the, the county July. has to act at the, the their meeting on July 25th to put it on the ballot. My guess is they'd like to hear before that. <laughs> they would have probably liked to have heard today. <laughs> yes. Um, April. Oh, I I don't see why we could. I agree. Bring it back on the 19th, and we'll make we'll make a decision on what we want to do there. So we'll leave a placeholder for it. And since I voted yes for that, I'm okay with that. On the 19th. Yeah. Okay, um, rather than a placeholder, um, I would just ask the staff to go ahead and put an agenda item to bring forward the jail facility use agreement on the 19th for Committee of the Whole. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Any further discussion? Oh, Brian has some more information about the current jail. Brian Heinrich, Mayor's Office. I did, I did want to follow up with um, a number of questions from Councilmember Barker. One of those was the timeline for the current facility remodels and Whatcom County is uh, has engaged with a contractor I think it's an architect as well right now and they expect to start those repairs this fall and as a reminder that will result in limited use of the existing facility as well as they remodel that the current facility 
Ahead, so that's to remodel it while it can stay the way it is because it's going to be about five years if if we do put something on the ballot. So um, I'm I'm assuming then we won't just leave that building like that whenever we have, if we choose to make a new facility, there's gonna be more process that needs to be done to that building, which was worked into this. It'll ultimately be demolished. Okay. And they're gonna pay for that? They're gonna pay for 78% of that demolition. So the city has agreed to pay for $158,000 of the estimated 1 million demolition cost. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion on the jail facility use agreement? Yeah, no, the, the, there's a, the jail is a very complicated process. Um, moving on, the next item uh, was entitled Options for Inquiries, Reports, and Complaints. Um, the, the title I don't think quite conveys everything that we're talking about. It was a broad ranging discussion that had to do with mechanisms for public feedback. Some of those might be complaints or reports about potential misconduct or just uh, uh, complaints about city um, behavior and the idea is that we need to provide an, an open door for people, especially for underrepresented or disadvantaged communities who may not normally feel comfortable coming forward to the city with, with complaints for, with regard to any action by a city employee. Um, specific options were discussed this afternoon including the ombudsman model, also the idea to contract with third party dispute resolution service. Uh, this afternoon there's a motion by Councilmember Vorneman to request the administration to bring forward some proposals and ideas for the form that that might take, potentially in the form of a pilot program to create that, that, that front door, that welcoming front door for people to complain. Um, is that an accurate description? It was a rather long motion. Yeah. And then in addition, there was further discussion on a, on a larger range of issues with regard to how we engage and are open to underrepresented communities um, and maybe put our equity commitments, which are in words, into actions. I think that was a, an express concern. Okay. And then the final action for the committee was a public, had to do with uh, public works and had to do with our 2018 to 2023 transportation improvement program. This is a six year program on transportation planning. We revise annually. The six year TIP is adopted annually to plan for and um, program public funding towards capital improvements for Bellingham's multimodal transportation network. State law requires we do this before July 1st of every year. Uh, the draft tip uh, was based on both public staff recommendations and also was presented to the Transportation Commission which recommended approval on May 9th. Um, we held a public hearing on the uh, tip on May 22nd and this afternoon we had a uh, council committee meeting to consider any further changes. There were none. We recommended to approve the resolution adopting the tip and I so move. Second. We have a motion and a second to adopt the resolution approving the 2018-2023 Transportation Improvement Program. Is there any discussion or comments on this item? Gene. Just a comment. I have to thank Ted and Chris Como and your staff for what you've done over the years on this. This used to be equivalent to having four wisdom teeth pulled without any Novocaine <laughs> years ago. And it were, I'm not kidding. It was really bad. I mean, we had nights when we were in here to... 12, 1 o'clock and it got delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. It was just absolutely horrible. So I want to thank you and your staff for what you've done over the years and it's really just the professionalism of what you people do and how that's laid out. So not only we understand it, but more than us, the people who stand on the other side of the podium and talk to us, they have not said a word this year about our six year street plan other than a couple of comments. So it, it, it reflects well on you and the mayor and the staff and everybody. So thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approving the resolution adopting the TIP signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, there are no minutes for approval um, at this point, so we'll move on to old and new business. Um, under new business, we did talk about the President's actions on the Paris Agreement, and there was a recommendation this afternoon. Councilmember Vargas, would you like to talk about that? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so as everyone is aware, the president did choose to pull out of the Paris Climate Accord, but the city of Bellingham is a city committed to reducing our carbon footprint and our emissions. Um, and we have an opportunity to join other cities and states to say that we are still in. Um, and I'm gonna make a motion that we join on to the proposal by the environment team at Blueburn Philanthropies. Uh, it is an open letter to the international community and the parties are agreeing 
uh, to join forces for the first time to declare that we will continue to support the climate action to meet the Paris Agreement and then the rest of the, um, the document is in front of you. So uh, I move, oh and by the way, a sidebar of that, the Mayor has already signed on to the Mayor's climate agreements with the other cities across the nation. So thank you very much for that Mayor. And I'm asking the City Council, I'm moving that we propose, that we sign on to the environment team at Bluebird Philanthropies. We are still in documents. Second. Second. We have a motion before us to uh, join in the open letter uh, to the international community and parties on the Paris Agreement. Um, Peter, procedurally, are we okay just approving this without reading this into the record? It will be included in the record or published when we sign it? Um, I don't think it needs to be read into the record. Okay. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Is there any further discussion on this? Okay. I guess we're good then. Um, all those in favor of approving our signature to the open letter signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Anything else in our old and new business right now? Roxanne. I'm going to repeat what I said this afternoon. So petition gather, gathers are gathering signatures to try to get an initiative on the Washington State ballot that would allow schools and also businesses to ban transgender people from using bathrooms. And so on June 19th, we will hold a public hearing and you can voice support, opposition or otherwise to a, a resolution that will be proposed that will ask people to please decline to sign that initiative. So get, please help get the word out and get people here in case anybody wants to provide testimony on that. June 19th, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else on their old and new business? Yeah. April? So I'll just give a follow-up that, um, yes, our open, our town hall is going to be June 13th. Um, for those that aren't able to attend or are going to attend and want to hear the follow-up, because in that public comment time, we do not respond, try to give people opportunity to let us know how they're feeling. We have allowed for 30 minutes in our meeting uh, June 19th. It's a daytime meeting and committee of the whole where we'll be framing kind of all of what we heard and then hopefully giving some direction on where we'd like to go after what we've heard from the community. Uh, the very beginning is a panel discussion and you have an opportunity to send in specific questions of what you'd like to hear them uh, say. They're a, a, broad, a, bit, a broad array of people, different people in the community, well, outside the community and within the community. So if you do have questions that you would like to hear what a, a panel, how they might answer them, please go ahead and send them to, uh, the, you can send them through email, you can call them in, or you can do it via social media on Facebook. We need those by the 9th if possible. Um, April, can you uh, tell us a little bit about the, the kinds of panels that are going to be, just kind of generally speaking, what they're background or what they're representing or perspectives? Yeah, you might be able to help too. We have somebody, Jeff Thomas, coming from the Department of Commerce to yeah. kind of give us a state of, what was it? Jeff Keller. Oh, Jeff <laughs> was it Jeff Thomas was our old, sorry, that was that was an old employee. I thought he was coming <laughs> still, back. Still have a little, <laughs> it's going to be so buried in there forever. Yes, thank you. <laughs> They weren't fond memories I had, so I'm, I'm quite happy with Rick. Um, he's going to give us kind of hopefully a, a state state of housing for Washington State because, as we know, th these are issues that a lot of people up and down the I-5 corridor are having. Uh, Rick will be there. He's the Department of Planning and Community Development current director, and he'll be giving us a bit of an overview of the state of housing in Bellingham. And then we also have Rose from Sustainable Connections that's going to give us a little bit of like what are some innovative solutions from the private sector and how it's looking on that end. And then our last one was Greg Winter. Uh, he's the current director of the Opportunity Council to let us know um, how the housing lobby that we've met our goals, but to explain that and then um, that that's expiring and some other things that are around that. So that's it. Did I do it? Okay. Yeah. Other than just to add, the location is going to be at Bellingham High School in the auditorium. Uh, doors at six o'clock. So, and then the programming starts at six thirty. So, if you want to get there and um, provide public comment, I'd get there at six. You can so you can sign up. Um, and there's ample parking, plenty of plenty of parking. And the program will be recorded for broadcast on BTV10. Unfortunately, for technical reasons, we won't be live broadcasting that event, but we will be rebroadcasting that event. Anything else under old and new business? 
Okay, well I'll move on then to report out our executive session. We had three items under the executive session. The first is a litigation matter, Haskell Corporation versus the City of Bellingham. Staff provided information to the council on a litigation matter. It was for information discussion only, no action was taken. Uh, the next item was potential litigation. Staff provided information on a potential litigation matter. It also was for potential for information and discussion and no action was taken. And the third item is exactly the same. It was a potential litigation. Staff provided information on potential litigation matter. It was for information and discussion only. No action was taken on that item. I believe that bring do we have any final ordinances? We have Okay, we have how many? One? Oh, wait a minute. Mayor's, Mayor's report. report. Mayor's report. Oh, how soon so we forget. Long. I'm sorry. <laughs> we have no planning director. We have no mayor. <laughs> but other than that, we're still let's, let's, okay. let's just go to the mayor's report. This is going to be very short, so that's good. First uh -huh. of all, um, thank you, Pinky, for mentioning that I signed on to that. Jill McIntyre-Witt just told me that there's a different thing that I should sign on to, so she's going to send me the information. I said good. <laughs> and Michael and I had the same list of the things the city has been doing to reduce emissions. Um, but one of the things that he didn't mention is something that is just, uh, April talks about equity as a day-to-day -day policy. Well, when we look at waterfront redevelopment and the contaminated sites and things, we're looking at the effects of seawater rise on or sea level rise so that's built into the factors that the that the planning department uses when they're looking at um, the redevelopment in areas like that that are on the shore so we just do stuff like that that maybe most people wouldn't even know about but our staff's on top of it so i just thought i'd mention that um, also i had said something earlier in the day but the but uh, I'm going to mention it again because it is very important to the city, and that is that Sheriff Elfo is looking, uh, re has requested from Yakima uh, an agreement, a contract like we have, um, in order to maintain our pretrial people in the jail better. And I'm very grateful for that. I have thanked him personally, and um, I think that, that will help, I know, our staff in the management of who was going there and who wasn't. That means that county um, inmates would also be eligible to go to Yakima, which I believe is much more appropriate than just the, the people that haven't been convicted of a, of a crime yet. So um, I also have two reappointments, and it doesn't say right here whether you have to approve them or not. Second, I think we do have to. I think I was going to say public uh, facilities district. Yeah. I think you do too. So I am reappointing Daniel Larner and David Warren to the Bellingham Whatcom Public Facilities District Board. Approval. Second. We have a motion before us to reappoint Daniel Larner and David Warren to the Bellingham Whatcom Public Facilities District. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, they're reappointed. Anything else, Kelly? Um, I looked through the comments that um, Laura left for us, and I went to give her the box back because I think it's kind of special that we have comments from people that are really being affected by this issue, um, and she's already left, so I'll make sure that she gets her box. Um, and they're probably more than anyone wants me to sit and read right now. I was thinking about reading them after you left, and instead I think I'll see if um, our intern can enter them into our website or, or, or Facebook account or good. one of those things so that there'll be a record of them and people can look and see the different things that were requested. Most of these are things that I'm sure the council already knows, but a lot about um, washing and storage and, and a lot of thank yous also to the city for the work that we're all doing to, to try to address the problem. Mm. So that was very nice. And I hope Laura's okay. I didn't realize what was happening behind me, but okay. okay yeah, it, it's an emotional issue, especially for those affected most directly by it. And, and you're right about climate change. That was only a partial list. I know Pinky recently was exploring district energy for the water, waterfront. That wasn't mentioned. There's numerous things the city's involved in. Consent agenda. Move approval. Again. We have a motion before us to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, passes unanimously. 
Elizabeth, is it time for final consideration of ordinances? <laughs> Agenda Bill 21626, an ordinance of the City of Bellingham, Washington, Municipal Code Chapter 17.10, and adopting by reference the 2017 edition of the National Electric Code as amended by Washington State, as well as amendments clarifying two administrative code provisions. Move third and final. I laid awake on this one. I didn't know which way I was going to vote, but I'll vote on this one. We have a motion for third and final reading before us. Roll call. Pinky Vargas? Aye. April Barker? Aye. Terry Borneman? Aye. Dan Hamill? Aye. Jane Knudsen? Aye. Michael Lilliquist? Aye. Roxanne Murphy? Aye. Ordinance passes 7 0. Hey, is there any further business for the sitting council? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>